So thank you very much. As Floyd was just saying, this, was, uh, this is work done with uh, my co-authors, Peter Crow, who's sitting there, Jens Semin, who's uh, probably coming rather soon, <laughs> and our colleague uh, Kenton O'Hara from Microsoft Research, who has also sponsored Jens Semin's fellowship. Good. So what we wish to promote with this work is a certain perspective in the way we design technology. And in promoting this, we, we are drawing very much upon the discipline of architecture in that spaces are always shared. So even though we design technologies for personal use, they're always part of an ecology of devices, an ecology of furniture, a specific site, as you can see here on the picture here, which is from a public, ma public library in Aarhus, where people sit in different configurations using the different technologies. So people share space both, both willingly and unwillingly, and we would argue that we should really consider this very carefully in the way we design technology, because technology inherently has uh, consequences for how we are configured in space and how we are able to enact our social relationship. So you can... So, and the idea about literacy is not to be normative. So it's not to say this is good and this is bad and here's a scale and we should just reach for the highest level on this scale. The important thing is to be aware when we design technology, how does this design configure people? And you can just take a really banal example from where I'm standing right now. So because of this microphone, my head needs to be just about here. Even if I move a little bit away, this situation breaks down. Also, we can see how technology and interior supplement each other in configuring people here. And here it's very supplementary in that there's a very abrupt step down here. So also the interior wants me not to get out there because that would be even more awkward. So this work is motivated very much by uh, aspects or issues that are also expressed by others. So this is an example from, uh, of a photo collection done by a photographer, artist, Eric Pickerskill, where he very nicely pictures how technology configures us in sometimes awkward ways. And I'm sure we all recognize pictures like these. And here on the pictures, he's removed the phone and removed the devices to, to spur further imagination. So you can see from these pictures that people are configured rather closely in intimate situations, but their visual attention is drawn away from, from each other and towards the phones. You can think about that if you also stand in a, in a packed subway train where you're really close to others and the way you, you react or the way we normally react to distance ourselves is to you know, focus on infinity instead of focusing right on the person standing very close to us in the, in the subway. So this triggers some distance. We can also see, so just another example with the phones, we can also see that we can also share contents, data contents on the phone, but in order to do so, we have to be really closely and intimately uh, connected with each other. Even the, if you want to share the, the audio from the phones, the, the length of the lines of the earplug also determines the distance that, that you need to be configured in. So with these examples, we would argue that the design of interactive technology has proximate consequences, and we should consider this. So this is another example. If you think about the Kinect sensor, the way the tracking algorithm works in the Kinect sensor is such that you need to stand face towards the Kinect sensor, and also the skeletons cannot overlap because then the algorithm breaks down. So you need a certain distance between each other when you stand in front of the Kinect sensor. And you think about this is, this is a system which is meant for playing around in the home. This is also slightly awkward in some senses as, you know, when you, if you're playing with your kids and if the kids are playing at home, you might even also want to get close. You might want to stand face to face. To face. I'm trying to illustrate this while connected to the microphone. Um, so we should think about that carefully. And this is an example of both how the very literal sizes of the display, sizes of wires, but also tracking algorithm and more deep technical qualities have implication for proxemics. So again, this is a, a matter of literacy and not a matter of critique, even though we, I pulled out a few maybe a little skeptical questions, but that's just to motivate our uh, work into this direction. 
What we're also particularly interested in here is also the dynamics over time, but you'll see that in the examples. First, I want to take a little step back, looking into the works of proxemics and the theory around proxemics. So over the past five or more years, this work has gained increasing attention in the Kai community. If we go back to Hall's work and the way that he described proxemics, he articulates that proxemics is a man's use of space and as an elaboration of culture. It's how people spatially configure themselves to enact social relationship. And this is work dating back to 66, so here it's obviously not described with relation to interactive technology, but merely with expect, respect to our environments and also interiors and so on. So you, you note this also yourself. If you walk in the street and you see two people walking in a distance from you, you can see from a long distance whether these people know each other, whether they're good friends or if they're partners, from the way that they configure themselves when walking down the street. At the heart of Hall's work is a description about proxemic zones, which has also been widely adopted in the Kai community. And these four zones range from um, from public to social, personal, and intimate. And just to give you some examples, so these zones are also tied connectedly to action. So right now, the way that I'm interacting with you is very much in the public zone. And what characterizes this zone is that I need to louden my voice, which fortunately this microphone helps me do. I also need to be more articulate when gesturing for you to actually see this. So the next zone is the social zone, which is the zone that you're in when you're part of a group. And I think we all enacted our, now our networking at receptions in the social zone when we mingle between each other and try to look out for people that we could connect to and then probably, and then in some situations we'll enter the personal zone, which is where we engage more in closely in discussions and actually are at a closer proximity to the people we engage with. And then there's the intimate zone, which is when you're very close to each other and you can feel each other's odor, um, touch skin, and so on and so forth. What an important point also in horse work is that this is also multi-sensory. So this is not only about distance, it's not only about number of centimeters. So for instance, the intimate zone, or a difference between the intimate and the, and the personal zone could be that you know if you're intimately close to someone, you can feel, you can sense or smell um, the odor of one person's shampoo. Or if you're in the personal zone, you can then smell if, if people are using perfume, sort of, with a good splash. So the way Hall talk about it, it's not only about distances, it's multisensory, and it's about enacting social relationship. Another thing is also that these zones are not fixed distances. They're dynamic, like changing over time and as a result of specific cultural and contextual situations. So what we contribute is that we, based on Hall's work and building upon other people's work also, we articulate further the concept of interaction proxemics that I'll get back to a little bit. And in particular, we promote some sensitizing concepts in trying to shape a language in talking about these qualities, because right now it's really hard for us to articulate. And we suggest here three concepts which has to do with proxemics malleability, proxemics threshold, and proxemics gravity. And I'll get back to the detail about what these are. So interaction proxemics we propose as a complementary perspective to some of the work on proxemic interaction that's been going on in the field. And this is not entirely new. It also builds on work by Kenton O'Hara and Jesper Kelsko and Jenny Pei and other people's work in this area. But particularly, we want to emphasize interaction proxemics is about how the interaction of technology has a bearing on how we interact with others. And it's about the impact of the technology on how we can configure ourselves. And always how this act out is always a complex interplay. So it's not like a predictive model. So this is a technology and then this is a distance that people will use to configure each other. It's always a complex interplay between people, space, context, interior, social relations, and culture. So just to contrast this, proxemic interactions is a complementary perspective which focuses more, and this is a bit of a caricature, but still focuses more on how we use distance as a means of interacting with technology. 
And there are some very thoughtful reflections also in this area um, around dark patterns and so on and so forth. But the point here is that we try to focus on you know, um, proxemic interaction on the one hand, which is how we use proxemics as a means of interaction with technology. It focuses inwards on sort of the relationship between people and technology and looks on how proxemics can be an input. And we'd like to point to this more complementary perspective where we look at how the impact of technology is on proxemics. We try to focus outwards from the system of people and computers and how that can figure us more broadly. And it's a matter where we see proxemics as a matter of how we can enact human relations. Good. So the sensitizing concepts that we propose here are a result of looking into theories of proxemics, looking into earlier work in this area, and also doing analysis uh, of some specific design cases that has been developed, motivated out of proxemic uh, qualities. So the proxemics malleability is the first concept. That has to do with the range of proxemic zones that we can act in given a, a specific situation and a specific design of, of a technology. And also it has to do with how fixed the situation is within a given range. So this is a very fixed situation, for instance, within this public zone. Second concept is about proxemic stress tolerance. This has to do with how difficult it is uh, what is the transaction cost in shifting from one zone to another? And the final concept is proxemic gravity, and that is looking at a situation over time, to what extent does the situation gravitate towards a specific zone? So the there's cases that we studied in, in articulating these concepts. There's first the planned meeting using video conference that we all know. So here we have the screen size influence, how people configure themselves in this room. The camera space also uh, determines how people would sit, the furniture, the size of the table. And particularly, you can see that it's in the setup, people, co-located people need to place themselves with a certain distance for them to be visible at the other end. And when we look at these proxemic concepts, we see how this is a very, this encourages a rather fixed situation. So it's the social zone dominates very much this situation. The, the threshold, the, the cost to change the situation, for instance, walk up and, and point to some contents on the screen is rather high because you really break out of the situation, so it must be really critical what you have to say. And also the gravity tends to, to, to center around this specific situation. So here's an example from another system which was designed to actually um, loosen up the situation a little bit. So here, this is a system where, um, which has democratic control in the sense that every participant on their remote device, on their mobile devices can actually uh, preview content from the presentation and also navigate the con or contribute to the navigation of this content. And through deploying this system, it was found that um, the proxemics, in terms of the proxemics malleability, this spurred more discussion amongst uh, people, uh, co-located people on the more personal level. So there was a more equal balance between the social and personal zones. And the threshold was lowered compared to case one. Still there was a strong gravity towards this more presenter uh, setup. And the third case, serve to, is a, an example of trying to, to democratizing the contents also. So not only in the navigation, but also the contents in video calls. And here we saw how, again, there was a more equal balance between the social and personal zones. So, so here people could share content to the shared display from their mobile devices. They could also uh, use the camera to share notes on paper into the shared presentation. So this, the threshold for shifting the situation and entering into discussions was lowered, again, compared to case one. And the gravity also was lowered in terms of it was more easy to shift situations because you, there was no need to walk up and sort of conquer the whole space to actually engage in the situation and provide contents and engage in, in closer discussions. So Floyd's watch is ticking. <laughs> so the, we analyzed the fourth case, but... Uh, I refer you to look into the paper for that. So in conclusion, we argue that there's a need for spatial literacy in how we design technology, and we 
provided a, a contribution in terms of these sensitizing concepts in trying to establish a more rich language around these qualities. And we would like to emphasize that these can serve both as analytic lenses, but also as generative tools in, in identifying specific design goals. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bert from University of Washington. Um, great work. I was wondering, how do you uh, use this framework alongside and integrate it with pre-existing relationships? Um, because those definitely have an impact on how the prosemic interactions would play out, um, since it's not just the technology, but also the human, humans themselves. So that's why I'm pointing out that this is, this is complex, it's not easy, and it's very um, situation specific. So it's not like we can predict what is happening. So we need to work very empirically, also do experiments, you know, build, build systems, bring them out, make experiments, and see how they work. But also think about when we design systems, what are the social relationships that we design for? And not just there are two users and then we invite some random people in that hardly know each other, but if it's designed for, to be used in, you know, amongst friends, then we should also make sure that, that when we study these systems that it's friends that are actually using it. So, so to actually make, so it's not, it, it's just complex to deal with, but, but it emphasizes that we need to, like you say, consider also the social relationship between people in our design. Hmm. Uh, hi. Um, uh, Brian Hall from the University of Michigan. Uh, really enjoyed your uh, sort of overview of these things. It was very nice. And, and I wondered, um, so when we talk about like especially the space aspect, so like intimate space and social space and technology, uh, we know that sometimes the experiences and the, the use of the technology um, requires that these be really, really different. So like on a crowded train or um, public transit, suddenly our intimate space is filled entirely by strangers. Or um, in other instances, long distance, our intimate space is actually not even physically there. Um, and is there really any language or, or sort of work that sort of lets us talk about that in an intelligent way where the intimate space isn't that? Is there, I guess when the, when the model isn't true anymore, what do we do? I think we, the first thing to emphasize is exactly like you say that, and as I also try to emphasize, is these zones are not fixed distances because they're highly context dependent. So what is that one situation, an intimate zone, and feels like an intimate zone that you want to be in, in another situation, the distance could be the same, but, but then we have different strategies for acting to sort of get us out of this intimate zones. And we should understand, so, so the zones are not fixed distances. That's the first thing to realize. It's context dependent, it's also cultural dependent. So different cultures have very different um, um, routines for how they engage with strangers, if you touch a stranger or not, that's different across cultures. So the distances are not fixed and we should, first thing is to acknowledge that. Yeah, thank you. Good, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much.